Welcome. My name is Bonnie Stabile, and I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the Shar School of Policy and Government. And I'd like to welcome you on behalf of myself and Dean Mark Rosell. He's presently pulled away for a Board of Visitors meeting, but he sends his greetings. Um, it's our honor and privilege to host events such as this to bring attention to problems of public import and advance dialogue on devising and implementing solutions. Uh, we define the work of the Shar School as preparing students to be future leaders and managers who advance the public good, and our faculty, through their research, help to provide solutions to some of the most pressing problems in the public sphere. Professor Faye Taxman, the director of our Center for Advancing Correctional Excellence, is just one such faculty member. The work of her center brings evidence-based practices and treatment um, to practitioners and policymakers in both the criminal justice and health fields. Uh, the Gender and Policy Center that I direct is concerned with raising awareness about issues which involve systemic disparities where race and gender are concerned. The criminal justice system as currently constructed, as our speakers and panelists will discuss, is beset with such disparities, raising evident questions of equity. And any examination of the system also raises important questions of efficacy and, inevitable, and the inevitable concerns of cost with the solutions that have been implemented thus far. And all of these equity and efficacy are criteria that are critical in the process of policy analysis. We recognize the importance of harnessing the expertise, not only of academics, but practitioners alike, and our students and citizens, politicians and policymakers in forums such as this, as we come together to talk about solutions to the problems that we see in the public sphere. So now it's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker to you, Jennifer Carol Foy. She's a former Virginia delegate and leader uh, for, um, of the Virginia for Everyone PAC. Uh, Jennifer was one of the first women to graduate from VMI, the Virginia Military Institute, and um, she's been a public defender and a recent gubernatorial candidate. In 2017, she ran and won as a first time candidate while pregnant with twins. Not everybody can say that. <laughs> During her time as delegate, she championed the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, helped expand Medicaid uh, and advocated for the Commonwealth's most vulnerable communities um, in large part through initiatives to do with criminal justice and other types of reforms. Uh, so this is one of the many areas in which she speaks with passion and authority. So we're pleased to have her here on the Shar School's virtual stage to address this important topic. Uh, Jennifer? Yes, hi, Bonnie. It's so such a privilege and an honor to be here and to be with all of you. And I want to thank you for the invitation um, to join in this very important conversation. And I am in awe of this panel. It is a packed powerhouse group of people who have been entrenched in the issues of criminal justice reform and who have been doing the work of making sure that we create a system that's more fair and more equitable and more transparent. So I wanted to start off by saying that, unfortunately, in this current political environment, everything has become more politicized. Uh, things that have typically been thought to be very benign, whether you're talking about education or the environment. But what I have come to see is that criminal justice reform is an area where I think Democrats, independents, and Republicans alike have come to the table and identified that there are areas of improvement that we really need to focus on. And as the, the first public defender ever elected to the Virginia General Assembly, um, I was astonished to see that in a lot of the criminal justice bills that we were able to pass, the people that we had advocating for many of our policies were everyone from the ACLU to Americans for Prosperity. So that means we were able to bring people from all sides of the aisle to the table to say that this is a systemic problem that we need to address, not only because it's creating uh, generations of uh, people who are low socioeconomic status, but children with single parents, of no parents, uh, the failed war on drugs, um, the high costs of incarceration without seeing the outcomes that we need, which is keeping our community safer and having people, um, you know, successfully uh, return to their communities in a way that makes sense because we're not giving them the tools that they need in order to do that. So I'm excited to have this conversation. I'm excited to say that I've seen up close and personal how this is a nonpartisan issue, um, even with 
uh, former President Donald Trump passing the First Step Act, which helped curb mandatory minimums, uh, place prisoners in facilities close to home, expanded women's rights. Now, while it's true that it only really applies to about 1% of the people who are incarcerated because it applied to people on the federal level, it's still movement and momentum. It still sent a signal, uh, you know, a shot over the bow that this is something that's important to Republicans and Democrats and independents alike. So getting to the issue, you know, there's a, there are facts and the facts are that today there are more black people under correctional control, that means in prison or jail or on probation or parole than were enslaved in, in 1850s. It's a fact that the number of people in cages in the US um, has increased to over 500% in the last 40 years. And not as a result of an increase in actual crime rates, but as a consequence of policymakers' decisions to raise penalties, create mandatory minimums, and establish three strike laws in an effort to continue the tough on crime narrative that has been perpetuated um, by all involved um, in an, in a, and has actually uh, done a lot of damage and they've implemented these policies to the detriment of generations of children and communities. Um, it's a fact that we have a failed criminal justice system because we have criminalized poverty and mental illness and created failed policies not rooted in evidence but rooted in racism and fear. I can't tell you how many times as a public defender I had a client who was picked up on a charge of trespass even though they were having a mental health episode or because they were bipolar schizophrenic, they were responding to the voices in their head, but people called and they were charged with disorderly conduct. These aren't behaviors that we should be criminalizing, but we should be diverting these individuals to ensure that they are getting the evaluations and treatment that they need, that they are gonna be medication compliant, that we give them wraparound services and housing because that's the society that we need to be. And that's how we need to show up and instead the people who make us uncomfortable, we call local law enforcement and have them step into the shoes where um, our mental health experts should be. That's a, another way that we have significantly failed the most vulnerable amongst us. We have too many people in jails and prisons because we have come to rely too much on police and prisons to solve our social problems. And of course, I've seen up close and personal how we have treated uh, the criminal justice system is a way to treat people with addiction or mental illness. And I can tell you it is a fact that we cannot incarcerate people out of addiction. We cannot incarcerate people out of mental illness. What they need is help and services. What they need is empathy and people who will help them get into programs. And it may mean that we have to be more proactive and spend more money on the front end, but we it will have a, a huge amount of savings on the back and it is just the right thing to do. We have to start thinking about how we get police and prisons out of the business of crisis response and mental health treatment. As it stands right now, correctional facilities are the number one provider of mental health services in this country and that is absolutely perverse. It starts at the level of arrests and the criminalization of mental illness the lack of budgets and bills focusing on people with mental illness and the services they really need. Um, and until we actually address the issue, it's gonna continue to exacerbate because the number of people with mental illness isn't going down, it's actually increasing. So we are not taking care of the population that we have. And we know that we're gonna see more people added to this population in the future. So why not be proactive and do the right thing and give the people the services and treatment that they need. But the good news is that we have solutions and the solution is multifaceted. We must have radical reforms to our system by providing restorative, trauma-informed, community-based solutions for people because they are demanding it, their families and communities deserve it, and it's the only way that we will keep communities safe, recidivism low, and have an effective, responsive criminal justice system. So we believe that the, this is really a public health issue when you're talking about people are suffering for opioid addiction, for example, and it should have a public health solution, not necessarily incarceration. So we have to find a better path forward. We have to start thinking more about how we get police and prisons out of the crisis response and mental health treatment. 
We have to start figuring out how can we have law enforcement do their job of responding to uh, emergencies, but not necessarily there to evaluate people, diagnose them, try to figure out what's the best um, you know, way for them to go, a path forward for them. That's, that's not their job. And of course, you know, probation, because we're getting people on the front end and the back end. And so what I'm excited about most is that you have policy experts on this panel who can speak very well about how it is a huge net that's catching too many people um, that don't need to be there. And we're talking about the front end as far as how we need to reform our cash bail system, because we have a two-tier criminal justice system here in Virginia, one for the haves and for the have-nots. In Virginia, you're more likely to sit in jail for weeks, if not months, uh, before your court date, before you have your day in court, if you are Black, poor, and innocent than if you are white, wealthy, and guilty. Because if you're wealthy enough, you can buy yourself out of jail. But if you're too poor to pay, then you sit there for weeks and months at a time, losing your job, losing your housing, oftentimes losing your children. And that is not how this system should work. It shouldn't be a pay wealth-based system, but that's what we have. So robust changes to our to our cash bill system has to happen. And that also means we need to have attorneys appointed at first appearance. So people are having substantive, robust representation at their first appearance when they go before a magistrate or judge to try to determine whether or not they should be held until their court date or released, or if they should be released on bond and what that looks like. And then when you talk about the back end and how we catch people up on the back end, many people who have served their, their time, who have paid their debt to society, have done everything that's been asked of them. But again, wealth enters the picture. And if they're too poor to pay their court fines and fees because they can't find a job, they can't find child care, transportation is an issue. What we do, we don't address those underlying challenges that they have. No, we don't. What we do is we put you back in jail. We put you back in jail, which acts as a de facto debtor's prison here in Virginia. And that should not happen. So we make sure that you pay. We make sure you pay us well and we demand our money or we incarcerate you, even though that is not right and it's definitely not constitutional. So these are the things that we have to make sure that we're treating people who are on probation as individuals, that it's a case by case basis, that if a person's having trouble finding a job, that we help them. Housing, we give them services. If they're mentally ill, struggling with substance abuse, then we give them people and services that can help them and meet their needs. That's what it's about. It's about giving them conditions. I'll never forget, I had a case where my client lived over an hour away from the courthouse. And the judge told my client, you have to show up twice a week to meet your probation officer who's over an hour away. My client had no car. My client had no job. My client had nowhere to live and no feasible way to get to those meetings twice a week. And might I add, my client was suffering from mental illness. So these are the ways that we set people up for failure, right? And so my argument was, well, you might as well put my client in jail today, Your Honor, because these conditions that you've created for probation, it's, it's untenable not for this person, not in this situation. So we can't have a one size fit all uh, criminal justice system, especially when we're talking about things like pretrial and probation. So these are the things that we're talking about. These are the things that we're trying to change. We have to move away from a punitive uh, culture of justice to one that focuses on restorative justice, because we know that that's where you meet real success. That's where you have buy-in from everyone. And having the community supports, because we know that communities that have more supports and services has less crime. So again, it comes back to, are we going to put our money where our mouth is? Are we going to really help the people who are suffering and the least amongst us? Because there's a saying, show me how you treat the people uh, who have less amongst you, and I'll show you the society that you are. And right now, the reflection that's looking back to us is not good, but we can do better. We can do better because we must do better. We have to strive to do better. And I'm excited to be here with all of these true believers, these fighters and soldiers, foot soldiers in the march towards justice to hear what they have to say and how we can attribute and lend our voice, our resources and our support to make sure that we will do better because we must do better. So thank you all so much. 
Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I'd now like to introduce our panelists who will each give a synopsis of their perspective on this problem in response to your keynote comments. And when each of them have had a chance to speak, we'll take questions from the audience and you can submit those questions through the Q&A function um, in the webinar. So we'll start with Faye Taxman, who I've already mentioned, but she is university professor here at uh, George Mason University, and she's the director of the Center for Advancing Correct Correctional Excellence, uh, followed by, we'll have Ed Ungvarski, who is a criminal defense lawyer uh, in the firm by his name, Bonnie Hoffman, who's director of the public defense reform and training uh, for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and Claire Castaneda, who's an independent advocate and former executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Virginia. So uh, with that, Faye, uh, you can start us off. All right. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. And um, I appreciate Bonnie's efforts to organize this very important panel. Uh, so I want to add a little meat to the a great overview that Jennifer provided about the state of the criminal justice system. And the reason I want to do this is because sometimes people forget how much the criminal legal system has really grown over the last 40 to 50 years. Um, so essentially 20% of the adult population in the United States has had some involvement with the criminal legal system, which basically moves the criminal legal system out of the realm of just being something that few people interact with, but something that more of our members of our society. And that's a very negative indicator. What that translates into is about 11 million people are arrested each year and passed through the doors of the justice system. And then we end up with um, a, a standing population of about 8 million people. So the consequences of this, as Jennifer has clearly pointed out, is that we have engaged in, people call it mass incarceration, but it's really mass criminalization. We have expanded our criminal code in this country over the last 40 to 50 years. So much so that these social problems that used to be handled in the community or by religious or other organizations, local government organizations, are now being thrust into the justice system. So about 50% of the people in prison and jails today have a substance use disorder and or they have a mental health disorder. And this is exactly what Jennifer was referring to is we have better means for dealing with this population than incarcerating them or putting them under the rubric of the justice system, which will actually add more stress and distress on this population. Uh, what that means is we have to build community capacity, um, which we've also known that during the period of mass incarceration, we've also shrunk our social safety net system. But we really need to expand substance use treatment services in our community and mental health services. Uh, we did studies a few years ago, and we basically found that on any given day, about 10% of the people in the justice system could actually access services within the community. That's unacceptable, uh, only unacceptable because we're spending our money in the wrong place. We're, we're happy to spend money around $30,000 a year to incarcerate someone, we're not happy to spend that money to provide the appropriate medical and mental health care that can actually deal with some of these behavioral health disorders. Um, so, you know, we really need to rethink our priorities about how we fund mental health and substance use um, treatment services in the community and expand. That means we need to also expand our workforce um, because we have a tremendous shortage of social workers, psychologists, counselors, uh, peer navigators who are actually um, available to help deal with the large needs in our community. Uh, 
So that's one particular area. Um, and there's another area which Jennifer talked about, which is the probation population. So there's approximately 5 million adults on probation in the United States, and the burden is heavy. Um, the average probationer has about 17 conditions, um, and those are the traps that lead to this recycling through the system. Uh, I, I actually, in one of my classes about a year ago, I had the students have 17 conditions of being in the class, like, you know, things like where they sat or, you know, um, showing up on time for class, things of that nature. And you can imagine that, you know, even in a college classroom, people were not able to really abide by so much burden placed upon them. And these conditions have expanded to the point that they interfere with people's ability to be employed, to be parents, to actually function as part of a member of our society. So we really need to both reduce the size of the probation population, but also the punitiveness of that because many of those conditions are not necessary or needed. Uh, so that's my third point. And my fourth point is that we really need to rethink our focus of attention on using the justice legal system as a way of responding to social problems. You know, we've greatly expanded this particular system and it's really just cost us as taxpayers a lot of money that doesn't necessarily have a good return on investment. And in fact, it actually has a very harmful effect because we're not only affecting the parents or the adults that are involved in the system, we're actually affecting their children themselves. Um, and so what that basically means is that about one in 23 kids in the US has a parent who's incarcerated. And therefore, we as a community um, need to actually prevent those particular youth from further from involvement in the justice system. So I would say, you know, what Jennifer has done is give us a great overview. Um, and I really want to focus our attention about this notion of improving community supports and making sure that we had the right type of services in the communities that are not just in the justice agencies, but in our social welfare and social services, in schools, in places that touch all of our lives. And then we need to really think about how we build community value system to help us take care of our neighbors uh, better than we currently do, since we tend to kind of move people into the justice or legal system. Um, so, you know, I, I, essentially, I think if we have a formula for how we can unravel the current legal system, our biggest formula should be in improving community capacity and helping lo local governments deal with the needs that people have in their communities, whether it's substance use, mental health, anti-violence issues, uh, and so on. So with that, I'm going to turn my turn the talk over to Bonnie Hoffman. Um, I've had my five minutes. I could go on. Uh, <laughs> <but> <laughs> anyway, Bonnie, I think it's your turn. Did you want to go? Did you want to go to me or to Ed? Yes. No. It sounds good, Bonnie. We'll okay. We, we can, yeah. Sounds fun. So. Um, Again, thank you for having me. I'm Bonnie Hoffman. I'm the Director of Public Defense Reform and Training for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. And I'm going to focus really on, on the pretrial end of, of this process. In 1987, the Supreme Court said that in our society, liberty is to be the norm and detention prior to trial, the carefully limited exception. And yet today, we've really turned that on its head. Um, as much as 70% of the jail populations across the country are people who are being detained prior to trial, people who are legally innocent and awaiting their day in court. And even here in the Commonwealth, we have about as many people being held prior to trial as we have incarcerated in jails serving sentences. 
And those in pretrial detention are often there simply because they don't have the ability to purchase their freedom, to pay their bail um, for a money bail that we have set and, and demanded in exchange for their freedom. So folks are spending days often just working to gather the money to pay their bail or waiting for their lawyer to be able to come to court and to pursue a bail hearing for their release. And those extra days in pretrial detention at a minimum are largely unnecessary and really often are highly disruptive and destructive to the very things that we're trying to achieve when somebody is, is being released in, on bail. Decades of research uh, really supports this. It shows that pretrial detention of even just a few days can have life altering effects. Um, what we can see is that in comparison to peers with similar charges and similar criminal history, people who are released within the first 24 hours of their arrest are more likely to have their cases dismissed they're more likely to be given opportunities for deferrals and um, diversionary opportunities. They're less likely to be sentenced to incarceration if they're convicted. And if they are sentenced to incarceration, they receive shorter sentences in jail and in prison. And those brief periods of pretrial detention also harm the very things that we claim we're using bail for. People who are detained longer face a greater risk of missing, missing their court appearances, a greater risk of being arrested for a new criminal charge while they're on bail, and actually faced a uh, greater risk for being arrested for a new criminal offense up to two years after the case is concluded. And when we think about it, it's really easy to understand why. A few days in jail can have tremendously destabilizing effects on everything from employment to housing, childcare, access to medical services and treatment. And those effects have these long-term uh, consequences to cases. And when we think about this from a, a financial standpoint, not only are we harming the person who we're detaining and their family, um, we're, we're harming ourselves. These additional days that we're spending for pretrial detention, I think the, the latest numbers we see from the Office of the Executive Secretary is that the per person local jail cost is about $90 per person per day that we're paying for pretrial detention. Folks who are detained, again, those short periods who are subsequently being released in days 5, 7, 10, 15 after their arrest, are also folks who are placing a greater burden on our public defense system because they're less able to engage counsel of their own choosing, counsel that they can pay for because we have destabilized them. We've taken away their access to their income. Um, so last year, uh, I'll take that back. The years, the years all seem to, to run together a little bit. I think it was actually probably 2018, which feels like last year. Um, Virginia launched a really historic pretrial data project. Um, so the Virginia State Crime Commission undertook to study a cohort of individuals. They looked at every person who was arrested in the Commonwealth for the month of October of 2017. It's a representative month for the year. And ultimately looked and followed about 23,000 people that were arrested. From their arrest through the, the conclusions of their case, they, they undertook this study in through December of 2018. And really some important findings have come out of that data. Most importantly, what we found is most people who were released prior to trial come to court and they don't get arrested for new charges. But really foundationally, we also found that about 33% of people who had their cases disposed of in that year either had their charges dismissed, no prost, or they were found not guilty at trial. And so we know that we are detaining countless people who are going to have their charges dismissed, who are going to be innocent. But one of the areas that I want to drill down on here for just this, this last minute or two that I have is the bail and the bail amounts that they saw. So the pretrial data report um, highlighted that one of the things they found was secured bond amounts at the time of release generally did not vary widely across sex, race, or indigency status. And that was promoted, and it often presents itself as something that would really seem to be a positive, that bail is consistent across race and gender and socioeconomics. But really, it is an indicator of a fundamental problem with our system because it's confusing the concept of equality with the concept of equity. Um, when we set the bail as the same for everybody, regardless of their circumstances, regardless of their needs, it means that those who are male, white, and wealthy have more ability to be released and can be released sooner than their peers facing the same charges with the same history and the same risk levels who are female, who are Black, or who are poor. We see that magnifying impact when we look at the way in which bail is posted. People who have greater access to wealth can post their bail in cash, which means as long as they come to court, regardless of their case outcome, they will get all of their money back. And those who are poor are forced to turn to bondsmen where they're paying a fee. They pay up to 10% of their bail amount simply to purchase their freedom. That is money they will never get back, even if they are subsequently found not guilty, even if they show up for every court date. 
And so we see these sort of magnified loss of wealth impacts. And when we add that and layer that over, what we know are the gender pay gap, where we see women are paid about 84 cents on the dollar to a man. Uh, the racial pay gap in Virginia, uh, according to Department of Health data, we can see that Black adults in the Commonwealth earn about $17,000 a year less than their white peers. And so we see already that magnified impact that setting the same bail doesn't mean the same thing for the people who were setting that bail for. And then when we layer again that on top of some of the, the persistent and systemic racism problems that exist that deplete wealth from communities of color, that Black people are often charged more for negotiated prices for things like cars, rent, mortgage rates, that home values are depreciated, and that there's simply just a less, that all leads to, uh, again, a, a compounding effect from generational wealth accumulation. What it ultimately means is that people of color who are arrested are making less money. They're using a larger share of their income to housing and transportation and core expenses, making it more difficult for them to post bond. And those delays in simply even being able to post the bond, again, as we talked about, means less likely to have your charges dismissed, less likely to get a favorable outcome, more likely to be incarcerated, and more likely to be incarcerated for a longer period of time. So if we're going to talk about a problem, we should always talk about a solution. And a solution in, in the Commonwealth is to provide counsel at first appearance. So by providing an attorney for people who are being detained at the time of their initial appearance before a judge, that first moment when they can have somebody address their bail, we know from other, other states that when you have counsel at first appearance, people are more likely to have bail set at an amount that is appropriate for them. They are more likely to be released. They are more likely to come back to court and they're more able to have better case outcomes because they're connected to their attorney and having their case handled right from the, uh, the outset. In Virginia, we know that the cost of, of the people who we are detaining and the population who's going to most benefit from counsel at first appearance is a population that's being released anyway. So folks who may be in jail between three days and 15 days is, is the data point we tend to look at. So folks who are going to be released on bail anyway, but because they're not able to post their bail right now are being held prior to trial. The savings we estimate for this at using that $90 a, a day rate is about $6 million dollars that we are spending to incarcerate individuals pre-trial unnecessarily. And so what we would suggest at a minimum, if we're looking to something that we can do that can make a change in our system, that's gonna promote equity, that's gonna promote better outcomes, it's gonna promote better community outcomes. It's supporting things like providing counsel at first appearance to ensure that people are not losing their jobs, they're not losing their homes, they're not being convicted simply because they can't afford to purchase their freedom. Thanks so much, Bonnie. It really got us well into one of the questions that has been raised already, I see in the chat, which has to do with um, starting to enumerate some solutions to the problems we've been talking about. So thank you. Um, so now we'll move to Ed to have a uh, defense lawyer's perspective on the issue. You just have to unmute, Ed. All right, I was doing so good to be muted. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to second Bonnie's, you know, time talking about the need to repeal bail reform, uh, the need to repeal bail, its uh, status. And, and I think in addition to having lawyers at first appearance, uh, Virginia should move to um, away from bail as a pretrial, uh, a way to control pretrial release. And just across the river in Washington, D.C., for 30 years, They've had evidence-based risk assessment determinations um, at first appearance with counsel present. Um, and the law in DC is that no one can be detained pre-trial based upon the fact that they can't pay bail. So there is no money bail in DC. And um, the studies that have come out of DC pre-trial services and probation are very, very good in terms of people returning to the community. So I think if you have, we don't need bail and we need lawyers at first appearance, but you know, I'm here as sort of the, the practitioner, not the scholar. Um, I think when we talk about mass incarceration and mass criminalization, we're really talking about other criminalization and, and other incarceration because while it's and now encompassing larger amounts of the population, it's still primarily the people who are getting jailed and being brought into the system are primarily, um, people who are poor, people who are um, of color, um, African-American, Latino, otherwise of color, people with mental illness, and then women getting charged with crimes that men wouldn't 
get charged with. And when I started 30 years ago, these weren't seen as civil rights issues or human rights issues, um, but they are now. They're seen as civil rights issues, they're seen as human rights issues, and they're seen as bipartisan issues. And I, and I think that's really important to recognize. Jennifer already talked about the First Step Act. That was thoroughly bipartisan. Um, um, it's Republicans and conservatives who are pushing for improved, um, pushing problems at the DC Department of Corrections for people who are detained there right now. Um, um, they're the ones who are pushing it. Uh, here in Virginia, it was bipartisan leadership, advocacy, and votes that led to the repeal of the death penalty, making Virginia the first Southern state to repeal the death penalty. That was bipartisan. So as I sort of reach the, I put a little clock here for myself, as I sort of turn into the second half of the minutes that I have, I just wanna talk about sort of a global issue, which is recognizing that decency and humanity toward those who come into the system is sort of underlying values that, that should apply throughout. Um, you know, we, we as, a, as a country going back now 200 and, 30 years or so, you know, we have these certain values. One of the values is that we look out for the least of these. One of the values that we have is that we are our brother's keeper. These are values that, that you know, whether for some people are religious based and other people, they're just sort of part of the ethos of the country. So when I see people who are in pretrial or later sent to prison, I'm just gonna talk about some of the problems that I see, which I think pretty much anyone would agree, that's not what we want. We don't want people when they're jailed or imprisoned to be fully separated from their family their, in their community. It prevents them from reintegrating and, and it's frankly, it's, it's not humane. But what we have is we have people who are, when they personal visits have been cut down, not just because technology has improved and they've advanced to now have video technology for visits as well, but they've replaced personal visits with video visits, which means that people who are incarcerated don't get to see their loved ones. Phone calls are incredibly expensive as third-party companies charge an outrageous fee for phone calls from the jail. I know that because my clients talk about it. And I know that because me and my colleagues, we give money to our clients so that they can have phone calls home. Um, there's the technology of maybe text messages or emails. They're 50 cents an email. So can you imagine if you had to pay 50 cents for every email you sent? I mean, just look back at yesterday's emails that, that, that you sent. And you probably sent 65. Um, and if you're, in, if you're someone who's poor or in prison trying to do that. So whatever it is, whether it's pretrial, whether it's probation, whether it's avoiding mandatory minimums, recognizing that we're all neighbors, we're all part of the same social contract, that's my alarm and that we have common values that should apply to everyone. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Ed. And now we'll move to Claire. Thank you, uh, Bonnie. <laughs> so I, in my five minutes, I have four basic points I wanna make and I'm gonna to have to talk really fast to get them all in. But they're all related to things that are actually happening today. And if you pick up the newspaper, you can read about all four of these things and I'm gonna talk about them from both the perspective of what we've done and what we could be doing. So for example, today was the first day that regional Marcus alerts went into effect in Virginia. And a Marcus alert is based, is named for Marcus Davis Peters. He was a person who had a mental health crisis and ended up being shot by police. And the Marcus alerts are about triggering a response in those kinds of circumstances that is not a police response. And it's illustrative of our need to rethink, as Jennifer and others have said, what we talk about when we talk about public safety. How do we keep people safe? And it isn't always um, best that we call the police. And one of the things that we need to change about current Virginia law is that mental health professionals who, who, who want to uh, take custody of someone and to put them physically in, in some kind of restrained setting, a therapeutic setting even, uh, have to go through a process that requires a court to agree with what they're doing. 
unless they call the police. And if they call the police, a single officer can make the decision that the individual needs to be uh, restrained. And so there's an incentive to engage the police in circumstances in which uh, someone's having a mental health crisis that we need to take out of our code and address differently. So we, the other thing we have to acknowledge as civil rights advocates is we advocated very effectively for deinstitutionalizing people with mental health issues and developmental disabilities uh, on the basis that those should those people should have services in their communities and we didn't make the services available. And so we have a big, a lot of catching up to do in terms of making sure that there are substance abuse prevention and treatment services and mental health prevention and, and treatment services available in the communities, because that's going to be the only way we're going to get out of the situation that, that Jennifer Carol Foy high, highlighted, which is our jails in Virginia are current major mental health treatment facilities and substance abuse treatment facilities, and that just shouldn't be the case. Um, second news story today is about the Virginia Beach police shooting where um, Mr. Lynch was shot by the police. Uh, it illustrates two different questions. And um, one is that there's Mr. Lynch was a person who was lawfully carrying a gun, um, and he happened to also to be Black. And the, the rights of Black people, Second Amendment rights of Black people to carry guns are, are, are simply non-existent. Um, and so that case illustrates the police's response is quite different if the gun is in the hand of a person of color than if the gun is in the hand of a white person. And that shooting also, and that fact also illustrates that we can't continue to rely on individual local departments to investigate situations that involve uh, police involved either deaths or serious injury. There's too much conflict of interest. There's a, a, frankly a lack of expertise uh, in, in addressing those situations. And what we need in Virginia is a single statewide investigative and prosecutorial agency independent of all police departments and even the state police um, that is like uh, a little bit like an inspector general that has the authority to come in and investigate any of these kinds of set settings and situations. And that'll be better for citizens because they'll be independent and not have conflicts of interest. And it'll be better for the police people because they'll be experts in um, understanding what uh, police shootings and police uh, harm uh, in the context of their uh, jobs. Uh, looks like and, and when that behavior is justified and when it isn't. Um, the next thing I want to chat about that's in the news today is the $5 million bail that they imposed on the uh, gentleman who, if we can call him that, the man who plowed his car through the Christmas uh, parade in Wisconsin. Um, I'm a sort of a radical on this point. My view is unless there is objective non-discriminatory evidence that somebody presents a danger to others, uh, they ought to be released on recognizance. Um, there shouldn't be a bail issue. Um, putting a $5 million bail on this guy, if he's, you know, he, he previously, um, he previously drove his car into somebody else. So he demonstrated that he's going to be a danger to the public. He should not be eligible for bail. Uh, and people that are not in that circumstance should be released on recognizance and bail shouldn't be an issue. Um, attorneys at first appearance is a great idea, but we don't pay people, either our public defenders equitably or people representing people uh, uh, on appointment uh, equitably. And so having attorneys come, we need to make sure we fund them uh, at, a, at an equitable pay level. And we also need to change the way that we pay prosecutors with the formula of which um, incorporates a, a, a belief system that they should be doing more felony uh, prosecutions. And that is, again, an incentive to, to up charges and to, and to bring charges that would otherwise not be brought. And finally, on police practices generally, um, I think we've We've made progress because we now can take somebody's license away for serious misconduct. On the other hand, um, we are in a situation in which uh, citizen review boards are thinking of themselves as only looking after action reports as opposed to engaging in 
in in really profoundly um, important reviews of 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 um, policies and practices in advance. You know what kind of technology is used, where is it deployed, uh, and how are police using use of force? All of those things should be reviewed uh, by the people being policed, and they should have an active role in determining those policies and practices. Uh, and finally, I want to underscore what's been said by a number of people. This is not a partisan issue. It's a bipartisan issue. Right on crime has been one of the key uh, advocates for a lot of changes um, and asking for, for our criminal legal system to be administered in a way that is effective and evidence-based. And whether they come to the table because they're concerned about the cost of our current system or the human or the human cost of our current system, uh, what matters is that that we all come together and make change that uh, that decriminalizes homelessness, poverty, uh, substance abuse, and mental illness, and creates a different way of thinking about public safety going forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Claire. Well, thanks so much to you all. Um, I see some questions in the Q and A that uh, I'm sure we can't get to all of them, but we can begin a conversation. I think of this panel as just an opening foray into a continuing conversation and hopefully subsequent panels may follow. Um, I see a question here from Chris Burke, who's actually a faculty member with some expertise in this field as well. And um, so I welcome his voice here. Um, and his question has to do with what we, we are doing to reduce um, admission to pr prison admissions, if you will. So that end of the equation. Um, and I wondered if any of you would like to speak to that um, point. I can briefly, um, I know that some of your wealthier jurisdictions, they have programs where uh, they have pretty much diversion programs where they have someone from CSB, Community Service Board, who will come out once a person is bought before a magistrate, they'll do an evaluation and they'll recommend if that person should be diverted to Western State Hospital for evaluation and treatment um, and you know show up at the uh, bond hearing and actually make recommendations. And oftentimes the judges adhere to the, their recommendations. So um, whether certain conditions should be met, things of that nature. But I thought it was really impressive because I've had clients who typically would have otherwise been incarcerated, but because of the community service board recommendation was actually diverted, um, you know, pretty much given a recognizance and diverted to evaluation and treatment. And as long as they met those conditions, they continue to be released. So you have, you have that, um, which I think could be really helpful. Um, but besides that, there's not too many other things. I know I know jurisdictions say they want to do it, but usually it's an issue of money and coming up with the money to be proactive to do these things. Faye, do you Sorry. have a comment? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I think another stumbling block here not only is you know, the diversion aspect, but, you know, Virginia has um, guidelines and the guidelines are instructive in terms of who should be, um, you know, who should be punished through um, prison. And, um, you know, we haven't really rethought those particular formulas about who should be incarcerated and who shouldn't. Um, so nationally, the efforts that have changed, uh, you know, incarceration rates in states that have seen more drops in incarceration rates, those have to do with changing criminal laws. So some offenses like aggravated assault offenses um, are considered and simple assault offenses are considered to be more of a uh, you know lesser charge than they currently are. There's also efforts to reduce the charges for burglaries and other types of property crimes that would also have an impact, but that hasn't been the direction here. So the two things that would make a difference um, in terms of prison capacity is reducing the intake, but also reducing the length of sentence. Um, and this is our larger challenge in the United States is we have longer sentences than any other Western, year, Western country in terms of the length of time. Um, so I think what Chris's comment also um, was, what about local prosecutors? And of course we know local, local prosecutors 
you know, are the front door to charging. Uh, so the question would be, you know, whether or not we could get support from the local prosecutors to really think about um, downgrading some of the criminal offenses. Um, so they would be non-incarcerative punishments or changing some of those charging practices. But I also agree with Jennifer, there are not major initiatives right now. In yeah, that can, can I chime in on the prosecutor's piece? Because I, um, the ACLU several years ago wrote a piece called Unparalleled Power about the power of prosecutors. And we're now in this really strange place where we want to preserve the local power. Um, the incoming attorney general is talking about trying to, to stand over top of prosecutors who are making uh, different, more progressive types of decisions about charging and about um, how to how to proceed on bail and, and those kinds of things. And so we don't want to be in a situation in which the local prosecutor's ability to make to do good things is is overridden by a you know a state official um, who is challenging their constitutional authority. At the same time, we want them to exercise that an unparalleled power in ways that is positive. And it is a fact that a lot of the criminal legal reform efforts had traditionally been strongly opposed by the state Commonwealth Attorneys Association until there was a, a, a small group of progressive prosecutors who started to lobby on the other side. And we made a little bit of progress in reducing um, the, the exposure to longer terms by um, getting rid of the the uh, law that said if you do three petty larcenies, you know you see you steal three bags of chips, you end up with a felony conviction as opposed to a misdemeanor conviction. So there's some some hope there, but I think we're in this really strange place right now about prosecutors where we want to preserve their local power and we want to encourage them to use it in the right way uh, to uh, help. Um, with the decarceration at the front end by not putting in people in jail and prison who don't need to be there. Um, just legislatively, there's, there was movement to, to get away from mandatory minimum sentences. So one reason why we have such uh, lengthy sentences and so many people in prison is because we have mandatory minimums. So if we uh, got rid of most of the mandatory minimum sentences that we have and allow judges to exercise their discretion at sentencing based upon various factors and information that comes before them, that would affect the downstream. Uh, second, some of the uh, prosecutors who are elected in, in recently 2018 and, and otherwise 2019, I guess, whatever, and recently, um, you know, they ran on, on policy platforms that they weren't going to charge mandatory minimum sentences, that they weren't going to seek mandatory minimum sentences. So, so, so politically, you know, one could be supporting persons who, who state that, that that is or will be the position of their office. Now, one can question whether all those promises have been fulfilled by all the people who ran and were elected, but, but certainly um, one could, you know, there has been some movement there. So again, that will, that, and, you know, for example, drug offenders, you know, third time drug offenses, felony drug offenses, a mandatory minimum 10 years in prison. Um, a lot of people don't think that's appropriate, you know, for selling three dime bags, or I guess now they're three $15 bags. So, so there are ways that at the front end to, to affect the back end. So the only thing I'm going to add, and, and I want to maybe dig into a little different piece of this, which was a highlight about, you know, rural communities being a driver for this and, and the cost incentive, um, which is that localities pay for local jails. Um, localities don't pay when somebody's incarcerated in, in the state penitentiary. And that often for you know more rural communities, that expense is a, a really difficult one for them to be able to manage. They have space limitations and, and they have cost limitations. And so the idea of, of utilizing prison sentences, um, you know, so I think there are, there are really two ways to look at that problem. One is that the state could be what I'm gonna loosely term as a more punitive lens and, and the state can shift some of that cost back to localities so that they are not simply off ramping. Uh, folks into their prison, but I think a much more productive way to do this is for the state to really be looking to create partnerships with local and small communities. Um, often those communities feel that they don't have enough alternatives in their community, and they're left with a feeling that incarceration is their only alternative to access things. The state is picking up the tab for people in prison. If the state were to reinvest that money, money that they are spending, 
um, in their prisons by investing it in local communities and creating opportunities for local and regional based services to allow small and, and rural communities access to the same things to give more alternatives. I think we could find another way to shift away from some of this effort that small communities face. It's not unique to Virginia. We see it all over the country that those smaller communities often are left with no other choices. And this is a great place for the state to really just think about redirecting its dollars that it's spending for prison facilities back into local communities through the, the avenue of services to give people more options. Yeah, there are two drivers here. One is that not every uh, locality has uh, a funded pretrial diversion program. And there's been some movement there to increase the number of pretrial diversion programs across the Commonwealth at the local level, but not every not every locality has one. The other really, you know, cynical driver is that when they did the 1995 no parole law, which essentially imposes an 85% of sentence minimum mandatory minimum on everybody who gets incarcerated they built the prisons in rural localities as quote unquote economic development uh, opportunities. And so the other driver here is that people want those prisons to be full. So they provide jobs in some localities in which uh, jobs are not easily found. So there's a, there's a real depth to the, to the budget drivers here that we need to be really thinking about. And, and I, I think Jennifer said it, Jennifer Carrefour said it well, um, you know, your budget tells us everything we need to know about what your priorities are and what your values are. Well, thank you so much to all. We have just a minute or two left. Um, and in that time, I just wanted to reassure people with questions and people that are participating that we're gonna be sending out. If you've registered for the event, everybody will be receiving some resources that the panelists have put together with regard to their organizations and the issues. And I see there's still a question, which I don't think we have time to answer right now from Stephanie about um, organizations for families of the incarcerated. Um, and I don't know if any of you have a quick answer for that, but if not, we'll put it in with the resources that we send out to, uh, to our participants. So I just like to say thank you all for attending and uh, please look for our Shar School events on the Shar School's main webpage and also for the Gender and Policy Center, come to genderandpolicy.gmu.edu to check out what we have, maybe support the center and uh, offer us suggestions for future uh, topics that you'd like to see us cover. But thank you all to the panelists. Thank you so much to Jennifer Carol Foy. Uh, it was great, including your voices. And I look forward to uh, being in dialogue with you going forward. <laughs>